Uh, we have our next participants here. So we have Hilary Lipsick and Christian Hernandez, both uh, from Red Hat. And the topic will be Helm and back again, an SRE guide to choosing. All right, guys, you can you can start. All right, so um, I'll start again. Um, my name is Christian Hernandez. I am actually a technical marketing manager, senior principal technical marketing manager, probably one of the longest titles I think I've ever had um, over at Red Hat. And, um, you know, today we're talking about, um, you know, Helm and back again, trying to um, decipher, you know, when to use what, um, you know, whether to use one over the other. Um, kind of a little bit of background first. Um, I work in PNT and um, in product management and engineering. So I work with um, Red Hat customers who are using our products to keep them happy and to help push their RFEs upstream. And, um, you know, a lot of the times I test alpha and beta software before anyone else. So it's broken, hopefully with me first before anyone else. So I spend a lot of time talking with them uh, about operators and Helm and uh, when to use what, and, um, you know, um, giving my perspective on, on, on that aspect. So um, with me is Hillary. So Hillary, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. So my name is Hillary Lipsig. Um, I am the team lead for the cloud services SRE team here at Red Hat. Um, we are the SRE group that supports several of OpenShift dedicated uh, managed services. Um, so Red Hat Open API Manager and um, some others. Um, and uh, actually, Part of the reason for this talk, this talk is all my fault. Uh, Christian <laughs> sends me a Slack message one day. He he deals with the customers on the sales end, and I deal with the customers on the support end in, in a lot of ways. He says to me one day, he says, uh, I'm trying to decide if I should write a Helm chart or an operator. And I said, well, what is the operator going to give you in exchange for all that overhead? And he says, nothing. I just already know how to do them. And I said, great. Sounds like you're writing a Helm chart. Uh, and that... <laughs> turned into a much longer conversation uh, that turned into the slides that you're about to see. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, uh, basically a conversation we had turned into a presentation. So um, so this is kind of a little background for, for everyone. If you ever have a really cool conversation, just turn it into a presentation. Um, and so uh, a little little overview and agenda, right? Some of the things we're, we're going to want to talk about here, um, we're, we're going to we have like about 50 minutes, so we're going to use all that time. Um, so we're going to talk about what are operators, right? Um, you know, the pros and cons of operators. Uh, what's Helm, right? Like what is Helm? Um, kind of a background on that, uh, the pros and cons of Helm. And then pretty much what um, you probably came here to see, when to choose one over the other. And, um, and then talking about um, how to transition between uh, the different types of of deployment um, uh, options out there, you know, between Helm and, and on operators. So um, for those of you who know operators, for those of you know, that, that know what Helms are, um, sit tight, right? Uh, it, it'll probably be an overview for you first um, before we get into like the deep weeds of, you know, why to choose one over the other. So um, I believe I'm going first. It is, um, what is an operator, right? And uh, I apologize for the, for the background noise. Um, again, everyone's remote, right? So, but we still <laughs> apologize for the for the background noise. And so, um, first of all, what what is an operator? So, um, before we get into what an operator is, um, let's let's talk about what CRDs are, right? So, I, I like to like start there to kind of lay the the groundwork. So, firstly, um, CRD stands for Custom Resource Definition. So, um, Kubernetes at its core is really just a collection of controllers that you interact with using an API. And these controllers act on objects and resources that are scoped into um, to its own proper domain, right? For example, the pod controller manages pods and the replica set controller manages the scale of that pod. So, um, et cetera, right? So they have their own particular domain. They, they, they manage their own particular domain. So. Um, these controllers are declarative in nature, so uh, desired state versus running state um, paradigm, right? So, like, if if it looks at the running state, and if the running state is um, is different, then 
uh, it does not. Um, if it's if it's the same, it does nothing. And if it's the uh, if it's different, it tries to reconcile that difference. So these primitives allows us to manage uh, containerized workloads. And in layman's terms, they use this Kubernetes really as a, a resource controller. So, um, so what if you want to manage other resources, right? What if you want to manage um, other things beyond the, what, what's in the Kubernetes API? So, um, so for for example, like I want to. Kubernetes to recognize my VMs. I want uh, Kubernetes to be more apps to manage more abstract things like database cluster, right? So um, in order to do that, you need to like submit a proposal for the Kubernetes code base. Um, you know that was kind of like the the past, but not anymore, right? So now um, you need to um, create a CRD, right? So by creating a CRD, you're basically telling Kubernetes that there's a new custom resource type. For example, like here in this example, you see fancy DB, right? So you can pretty much name it whatever you want. Um, and then when you uh, inquire, you know, against that custom resource, uh, Kubernetes understands your language, right? Kubernetes now you kind of defined of like, you know, what is Kubernetes? Um, you know, what is fancy DB? And Kubernetes understands what you mean when you start speaking that language to Kubernetes. So, um, so now when we create a custom resource using the, you know, the the type defined by the CRD. Custom resource objects gets created, right? So now you can say, "Hey, get me everything that is uh, fancy DB." So um, this is fine for simple CRUD operations, like you know, create, update, delete, you know, um, objects inside of Kubernetes. But what if you want more complex things, right? What if what if you want things that only operators know, you know, um, how to manage, right? System operators know how to manage, like how to recover from failure how to back up the object, how to restore it, storage management, right? Like, et cetera. What if you want like, a little bit more complex things um, um, for Kubernetes to manage, right? And this is really the idea behind operators, right? So operators isn't like something um, that's necessarily new to Kubernetes, right? This is, is, is really based on the, the core idea of uh, CRDs. So um, operators, it's really to codifying um operational knowledge right as, as you as you see here you know you're taking your sysadmin you're taking your uh your sre and you're kind of just putting them in a box right <laughs> you're, you're you're codifying them there and um it's really it's, it's a method of packaging and deploying managing specific kubernetes applications right and, you know so i'm talking about applications instead of controllers so this has operational knowledge of uh, upgrade patch recover from failure um, tune application and services, right? You can really go into um, fully auto autopilot here. Um, operators, um, you know, by extending that 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 cube API, it goes you know beyond that and kind of takes care of the application for you. So, um, so you're, you're taking this um, the admin knowledge, this operational knowledge. Uh, it historically has just been um, encapsulated. Um, been taken care of by the admin, and you're kind of encapsulating that in um, um, codifying it, essentially, right? You're you're democratizing the apps, right? So now, where um, uh, either you know an SRE or a developer can go and um, um, you know request this this application, the the application now kind of takes care of itself and kind of it becomes a self service thing, right? So. This is a really, really, really long-winded way of saying that I'll replace you with a small shell script. There's just that old joke that says, hey, you know, I'm going to replace you with a small shell script. This is kind of that on, um, you know, at, at, uh, at, uh, on steroids, I guess, is, is, is what the saying goes. Um, what's really cool is that um, you, know, you can get started with things like the operator SDK, right? And, um, and so the, um, I think... Uh, for any good operator, a good operator requires a story. So I'm going to hand this to Hillary because uh, Hillary, I think, has um, a, a really good. Um, this is basically her her slide, her idea, and I think it's it's a great description of it. Yeah, um, Christian once told me he wants to see a good operator requires a story on a T-shirt. So maybe someday we'll actually make that happen. Uh, yeah. yeah. So basically, what Christian said, right? Um, Operators are super powerful because it basically takes that um, stateful paradigm and applies it to the application layer. Um, 
And the most effective operators are operators that are released by the community that develops and maintains the application that the operator deploys. Ideally, this community understands the who, what, where, and how of their software. So who are the end users? What are they doing? Where are they running this? How should it be managed? You're going to use your operator to do more than just install software or even just to upgrade software. It's going to be responsible for other maintenance tasks that you write into it. And sometimes the operator deploys the software, but sometimes the operator actually is the software. So SREs, especially within Red Hat, we develop and maintain operators to automate many tasks, not just deploying and maintaining SaaS products. By and large, what we're about to talk to you about is uh, the SaaS products packaged as operators. Uh, a lot of the stories you're going to hear, uh, some of the perspectives, some of the, the advice is specifically applying to that use case. But there is the additional use case. Um, and if you go to any like SRE convention, you'll get to hear a bunch of great talks, some of them presented by friends of mine, on using operators to solve problems um, as standalone software. It is a piece of software. It requires a great story, it requires a good use case, planning it the way you would plan any application. And it has a life cycle of its own. It both operates the full life cycle of the application that it's going to be packaging, deploying, maintaining, and has its own life cycle. So that's really important to remember when you're looking at operators, when you're using operators. Uh, it's not just tooling, it's way more than that. Uh, I'll go ahead, next slide, Christian. find that button okay um <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so it, it's important to know right i mentioned the the operator sdks right and there's is it's important to note that there are different levels of operators so um as as, as you're hearing us talk about uh, specifically um helm and in this particular talk we're, we're, we're comparing really helm and, and the golang one but um there's there's different levels and then there's different types of SDKs, right? So um, here, as you can see, you have Helm, you have Ansible, you have Golang. Um, in the operator SDK, I, you know, you know, being in PNT, I talk, I talk to pretty much everyone at Red Hat. You know, they're also thinking about having a, a Java and a Python one. Um, so it's 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 really, um, you know, the, the, this is just the beginning, right? And you know, don't don't think you need to know. Um, you know, Golang through and through just to get fully, you know, operational, right? Um, so um, you, you, you talk about um, the, uh, the different levels, right? Where you, 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 know, um, you know, you see here in the slide, there's essentially goes from, you know, you have the idea of, you know, basic install, right? Essentially, it's just like this operator just installs the software for me. And that's pretty much it to all the way to what we call autopilot, meaning that once you instantiate an operator, it takes care of itself. And I know it sounds like magic and it um, kind of almost is, right? There's not a lot of operators that are fully level five. Um, some of our uh, ISVs at Red Hat, um, you know, like something like like CrunchyDB or, or CouchBaseDB are actually at fully autopilot, meaning that um, if you ever get a chance to see a, a demo of, of, of CouchDB, you'll, you'll see how it's autopilot. Basically when you scale it, all of a sudden your data is, you know, everywhere. And, you know, it's, um, you know, it'll, it'll balance that, that database out. And all of a sudden you just scaled out automatically, um, which is, it's really cool. But um, as you see here, there's, there's different levels, right? So um, you have the, the, the ability to do just install the ability to install and upgrade um, lifecycle management, um, you do a deep insights and then really level five is kind of like the Nirvana as we've been, we've been talking about. It's just kind of self um, self healing, self taken care of basically that picture of, of the um, of the operator going into that box is essentially the, the whole thing um, uh, autopilot. So um, yeah. pro no, go ahead. I was gonna say, just, to, just to interrupt briefly. Um, yeah. The, uh, the managed services from Red Hat that I support are typically a, a, a level four with some level five capabilities. Um, so these are typically um, operators that are, are I don't want to say enterprise ready, but they're also not not enterprise ready either. So um, that that deep insights, the metrics, et cetera, that that really enables um, 
not just for your operator to be very useful and to, you know, help the people who are leveraging it to understand what's going on with it when something goes wrong, but allows you as the developer and maintainer of the operator to continuously improve. Having those insights, having those metrics, having those alertings, you can do ESSA reactions like create SLOs and SLIs based on that and continuously improve your software because you have implemented that in your operator. Yeah, and I think, no, it's fine. No, I think you touched on an interesting point where the insights are really important, right? So like, um, you know, I, th I think that jump from level, level four to level five is, I think has um, a lot to do with all the insights that you're getting, <laughs> right? Exactly. Continuously in, improving. So yeah, that's, no, that's definitely a, um, uh, a good point to bring up, right? Where, yeah. where that's very, very important, right? Data is very important and, you know, Knowing yeah, how to codify much, something depends on what ha is happening on the system. Yeah, exactly. It's very much a uh, crawl, walk, run thing in terms of, of leveling up your operators. Um, like in terms of like an SRE is supporting it, I don't love supporting below a level four. There are lots of great reasons to have below a level four. There's lots of reasons why you might never go up that high. That's a different talk. Um, yeah. and I think we've actually <laughs> kind of touched on that again later in the presentation. Um, but, um, you know, it, as an SRE, what I what I get from those insights, metrics, and alerting, what I can send back to the community, and a lot of these are, you know, very much they're open source projects. So is an SRE supporting them in a managed way, but they're open source. Everything that I encounter operationally, everything that I suggest push back on get changed, that goes up to the entire community, uh, which is more about how Red Hat operates than operators specifically. But because they started packaging and selling things as an operator way, we're we're able to put back more operational knowledge into the software and benefiting everybody. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So um, let's talk about uh, the pros and cons of operators. Right. And so, um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, sunshine and rainbows and maybe not all be a sunshine and, and, um, and, and rainbows, but we'll talk about how, um, you know, some of the good things that, um, operators give you i think uh, hillary touched on a on, on a lot of them um so it's you know it's it's a it's a cons it's it's a community of, of of freely available and open source software right and um with the operator i'm gaining all the advantages of technology without the need to like really deeply understand it right so really as a consumer um you know, if, if I just need a reliable uh, database, right, I go back to the, the CouchDB example, if I just need a reliable database that, um, you know, I don't need to take care of, right, an operator is, you know, of level five, level four and five above is, um, is v extremely valuable, especially for those teams that, you know, there's, there's those teams, there's the, you know, we talk about DevOps, there's those teams that do a no ops kind of a thing where it's just kind of like a group of developers, you know, you, um, you know, maybe using AWS or something and they need something. They don't have a DB admin. They don't have administrators, but, you know, they they'll use something like an operator because all that operational knowledge is codified and you um, you gained the experience of the overall community. Right. And um, um, as 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 really for me as a um, like if you're on the developer side, right, or if you're on the um, the ISV side, um, you know, I'm, I'm making my application more accessible to the world, right? So for for example, um, you know, I have uh, an application that automatically takes care of itself. More, more and more people are going to want to use my application. And um, more and more people are, are you know, as, as it gets more and more reliability, more and more people contribute, right? And this is a whole open source um, ideology is like, hey, cool, I have a lot of contributions and the software keeps improving. My software keeps improving. Um, and I can drive that adoption to my application, um, even internally, right? Even if like I'm I'm doing this internally with with my own um, and my own company, um, you know, I'm driving that adoption, you know, um, you know, it, within my own within my own company, right? And so, um, so the the reconciliation loop, right? The, in, in the operator, right? We'll talk. We, we talked about that um, uh, the declarative approach within my own domain of my operator. Um, you know, if something isn't ready yet, right? So like if, if you know, if something isn't, you, you know, we as applications grow in complexity, you know, certain um, dependencies come into play. If it isn't ready yet, well, the operator can just take care of it for you, right? And so this is kind of the things where uh, scripting becomes a lot easier 
deployments become a lot easier because the operator's taking care of a lot of the stuff that custom scripting would have taken care of. And, um, you know, there's no snowflakes, right? And so, you know, one, one of the... Um, one of the cool things about it is that, um, you know, everything's the same when operating uh, a system that's built on operators, right? It's just declarative. You have that contract, right? We, we talk about Kubernetes operating on like promise theory where it's like, okay, you know, I declare that I want this application stack to be there. It'll just be there, right? And you operate that the same, whether, you know, when you're private cloud, public cloud, when you're Azure, AWS, right? If you're using Kubernetes as that common fabric, and operators as how to operate that, um, you know, you get that consistency across um, across everything. So there's no snowflakes because it, you know, everything's pretty much managed the same way. So, um, so I'm going to pass it all over to Hills here. Talk about the cons. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I obviously I'm supporting operators that are you know packaging and and deploying and delivering uh, SaaS products in the field. Um, so I'm gonna maybe make some enemies amongst the uh, operator community here, but they have some serious downsides. Um, that friendly neighborhood reconciliation loop. Uh, you'll notice it's both on our pros and our cons side. Um, the fact that it allows for retries and waits means that you're constantly retrying the same thing over and over again, and it will never fail out, even though a failure would be more appropriate. So there have been several incidents that I've worked where uh, the Kubernetes API server was being flaky, and that was reducing customer access to their managed cluster and managed services. So the customer complained that they were having connectivity problems. Um, and I, so I take a look, and it turned out that the issue was a reconcile loop that would never finish. Uh, so the Operator Lifecycle Manager, or OLM, which is an operator that runs to help basically uh, keep all of the other operators on a cluster yeah, on, like a, on correct versions up to date. Yeah, meta version, yeah. right, of the operator. Yeah. Op operators for operators is what I like to call it. <laughs> yeah, operators for operators. The, 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 the operators for operators is great, but it's also where things get a little dicey. You have to be careful. So. Uh, OLM was trying to upgrade a community operator. So this is not a managed service. Uh, and to add a little bit of context, if you have a cluster with OpenShift dedicated, you can go and download community operators um, directly through the UI. They're right there, they're available, they're free, right? Um, and it'll just like automatically get it go up and going for you and OLM will install it and help maintain it. Uh, so the problem was that the deployment configuration for this community operator was not backwards compatible. So what they had done is they had changed a field that was previously immutable. So not only was it no longer immutable in the new version, but it was also different. Well, the reconcile loop is trying to upgrade the exact, um, that exact value, right? And... So you had you hit this condition where it's like, I'm gonna upgrade this. Okay, well, I need to go through and change these values. Oh, I can't change that value. It's immutable. I failed to upgrade. The reconcile loop happens. There's an upgrade. I gotta apply the upgrade. I can't apply the upgrade, fail. And this ended up creating so much pressure on the API server in etcd that it actually created issues where the, the connectivity was down, right? The, the ability to access a cluster went down for a couple minutes. And it was intermittent, right? Because it would happen every time the reconcile loop was looping. Um, so what we just did is we just went and deleted the old install plan and then the new one downloaded in and upgraded fine. Um, so that brings me to my next con though. There wasn't any alerting for this, right? This wasn't, there was, there was no, no insights, no alerting, nothing going on to tell us, hey, this is failing. This is why it's failing. That didn't, it wasn't written in, it didn't exist. Um, so without corresponding alerting and logging, watching the operators and the operands, operands being the things the operators operate, um, I wonder how many variations of operate I can get into one talk, we'll find out. Um, <laughs> I'm keeping track. You're not gonna be able to detect <laughs> failures, right? Um, so with something like Helm, because it does fail, that would have been really readily apparent. It would have been super obvious. It would have been like immediate and, and you wouldn't have ended up with that pressure on the cluster causing problems. Um, 
which makes me to kind of my next con, right? Uh, operators have more overhead to write. So a typical operator is going to have more logic in it than a Helm chart. And there's power there, but it has trade-offs. So developers writing operators must realize that they're writing software with a software lifecycle. I said that earlier. It should be versioned, tested, and released as any application would be. That means unit tests, folks. Unit tests. Uh, since it's not just tooling, it's not always going to be the right tool. Um, and something or someone still has to operate the operator. So another operator like OLM, operators for operators, like we discussed, a person, or both in situations like above where OLM steps on the operator and you have to fix race conditions by hand. Um, and finally, no snowflakes. And you'll notice that this again is on my pros list and my cons list. And I say mine because I did the first version of these slides. Um, so as an SRE for a managed service offering, my fleet is not uniform. These are customer owned clusters with customer owned workloads. And it creates an ecosystem, not a monolith. I SRE an ecosystem. It's a very unusual version of SRE, right? Um, so they're buying OSD clusters and they're buying AWS instances and they have budgetary and size constraints on resources. So like CPU and memory and so forth, right? Um, so one of the things I see a lot is that customers are pushing the limits on their, cl their, their cluster resources, right? They're trying to get the most value for their money. And I can't blame anybody for that, right? That you're paying it. So the problem is though, that in operator land, you have installs and upgrades tend to spike the, the resource usage by the operator, right? It's a temporary spike. Um, but if I have multiple applications running, um, it's possible that there might not actually be enough resources for that installation or upgrade to complete, even though there would be enough for the application that the operator is, is deploying and managing to just run in, in normal runtime. So it's easy to get around this, right? Uh, you just scale down some temp some workloads temporarily so that, uh, oh, we lost Christian. Uh, anyway, you just scale down some workloads temporarily so that that bulky installer upgrade can finish. But operators are managing operands. So if I have replica sets defined, um, my operator is going to realize I've scaled something down and scale it right back up. So it's going to undo my changes before I get the benefits of my change. So that also means that I have to scale down the operator. So first I'm scaling down the operator. Then I'm scaling down the, the workloads that I, I don't want or don't need temporarily. And that begins, begins to get to an uncomfortable amount of room for human error. So if operator B is also being managed by operator A, operators for operators, like we said, I'm going to have to start scaling down a lot of pieces before I can have my otherwise fairly simple change stick around. And this is not too great. And if your operator story isn't good, if your operator isn't delivering value, there's not a lot of benefit that accompanies that extra toil. And this can hit just, you know, customers who are administering their own workloads the same as it can hit me as an SRE. Um, and I actually see it quite a bit. Like, I think I said that. Um, one of the, one of the uh, services that I support is an operator and it actually installs four other operators and some of those other operators that it installs excellent super great operators like the prometheus operator gets installed amazing couldn't live without that um but some of the other ones are not really doing a lot of those day two day two being operating the application actions um that couldn't be handled by the first operator and so in this situation that cascade of operators it can be a little bit difficult to work with. Whereas um, some sort of mix and match of like Helm charts with operators would be preferable. And really the takeaway here from having common points between the pros and the cons list is that these are double edged swords. So you need to be careful, be mindful about how you use them. Uh, next slide, Christian. All right, cool. Now we'll talk about Helm. By the way, that was, um... I was always great. I always, I always like uh, to listen to Hillary actually talk about um, what actually goes on with customers, right? Because we we like to talk about how everything's all great, right? Um, there's this whole this old uh, saying, right? The everything goes according to plan until you get punched in the face. So um, <laughs> that's always a, um, a fun thing to hear. So um, let's talk about Helm. 
right? So Helm, one of my favorite um, uh, topics here. Um, so would it be nice if managing applications on Kubernetes was just like any other framework, right? So like, for instance, if you're using um, like a Red Hat distribution, you're doing like yum install something, right? Or app get install, brew install, right? So, you know, what, what if installing and managing applications were just like anything else, right? And so um, what, uh, what Helm gives you and what, what Helm is really at its core is, um, is a package manager, uh, package manager and a templating aid, uh, engine for Kubernetes. So it can be used uh, to repeatedly and reliably deploy cloud and cloud native applications uh, with the correct configurations. So, um, you know, ideally the software you want to run already comes with Helm, um, with, it comes with, with Helm chart supplied by, by the maintainers. But if not, you know, you can, you know, do that, do that yourself. Um, you know, you, with Helm, you, you have that ability to um, configure and deploy software um, you know, across your, uh, across your fleet of clusters. Right. And so, um, so just like an operator, right. Just, just like Kubernetes, right. Where we live in a Kubernetes land. Um, I think, uh, uh I saw a joke somewhere, a post somewhere that someone on the resume put a, a Yamble engineer. Um, this is essentially what we've becoming so far in, in, in a cloud native ecosystem with, with Kubernetes. Right. And so just like Kubernetes, just like with cloud, um, just like with, with operators, Helm, um, is declarative, right. And so you provided a uh, Yaml or JSON, uh, configuration. Um, but yeah, so, um, um, you, you know, it's, it's, you know, first time I used YAML, uh, for, for an API, I, you know, I, I don't think anyone thought that would ever catch on. Right. It's like, you know, look at it no, now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were in the, these were in the days of like, you know, XML was still king, right? Yeah, the first time yeah, yeah. I saw YAML, right? Especially because um, you and I worked together in this, and then I did several yeah. other companies like this where it was like, you know, web to print. XML was like the That's heart it. of yeah. how that how that worked and how, how it worked reliably. And so we start seeing JSON and YAML, and we're looking, you know, and of course, one being a subset of the other, it's a different story. Um, but so we're starting to see JSON, and we're like, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. And we see, so we see YAML, and we're like, uh, you know, I don't know if I like it as much as, as yeah. JSON version of things. Yeah. And I, we just kind of, I know my team, we has back and forth, we're like, yeah, well, no, it's not going to be a thing, right? And, and it's yeah. literally yet another markup language. It's almost like the creators didn't take it very seriously themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it is, it now runs my life. So just yeah, now me. it's, now it's, now I can. You know, before I used to have problems. Now I think I can indent in my sleep, right? Like now it's just, now I can like see ind indentation problems like from a mile away. I'm like, oh, that's indented wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's how how yeah. weird, how funny. But yeah, like back then it's like, uh, like why would you ever use this to post a request? Like just you JSON so much easier. But you know, look at us now. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so with, 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 with Helm, Helm comes with like, you know, a few different components, right? So it, it comes with, um, the CLI, something called the chart, something called templates, values, uh, revisions. These are kind of the, the nomenclature you'll hear um, when talking about Helm, right? So you'll, you'll hear these over and over again. So uh, the, the CLI is really just a binary, just like anything else is a, Go, it's a Golang binary. Um, and it provides, you know, it's, it's basically your interface into, into Helm, right? The ecosystem It's basically how you interact with Helm ecosystem as a whole. Um, so uh, charts. So charts is nothing other than YAMLs, right? So templatized YAMLs. So it's YAMLs where you get to plug in uh, different parameters, um, and um, you know templates. It, it provides you with that dynamic uh, capability. It's really under the hood. It's, it's Golang uh, templating. So if you're familiar with Golang templating, it essentially um, uses that, right? You have conditionals, you have loops, you can do all kinds of things. A uh, really fancy way of, in, of, of managing your, uh, your templates. And your values is basically the parameters you pass into a chart, right? And so you have a chart um, with, with you know, different variables. And in order to plug in those variables, you provided the values file, right? Foo equals bar, for example, right? Let, let, let's use something simple. Um, that foo, inside the template will be replaced with bar um, in, in the chart and it'll render your um, your uh, Kubernetes YAML. So it's basically a templating, a, a way to templatize Kubernetes YAMLs. Um, it 
what it spits out is a uh, raw raw yaml essentially and um you know when a, a, a running instance of that yaml right so when you, when you when you merge the two when you have your helm chart when you have your values and you merge them and then you get your your uh, your your raw um YAML for Kubernetes, we call that a release, right? You have a release inside uh, a Kubernetes um, cluster. And um, and then you have different revisions, right? You know, version one, version two, version three. So these are the kind of the, the things that um, that you'll hear with Helm, right? I, I, I kind of don't want to spend too much time on Helm um, background because there's really not a lot to it. It's it's and when when I say that I actually mean that in in a way that is uh, positive, right? Uh, for for me, I'm pretty sure for Hillary, but I don't want to speak for her that I love it when software is simple. I love it when it gets out of your way, right? Uh, it's it, you know a lot of times I know myself I'm guilty of this when I'm writing something you're trying to be clever, but in actuality you you want it to be easy to use and easy to consume. So um, nothing too majorly complex with Helm. It is basically a uh, a package manager. Think of it as like YUM or DNF for Kubernetes. This is basically what it is. Um, so, Hillary, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or if you want to go straight to the pros and cons of it. No, yeah, let's go straight to the pros and cons because it's basically just drilling down on what you said. Yep, cool. All right, pros and cons. That's uh, So here, I think Hillary is going to play the bad cop here. <laughs> um, no, I'm the good cop. I was bad cop last time. Uh, that's right, that's right. You were bad cop. Yeah, you're, you're the good cop. I was bad cop last time, time. yeah. Um, you need more coffee, sir. <laughs> it's early. It's early over here on the West Coast. So for the, for those it that is. don't know, it's early for us. <laughs> yeah, we, we've just hit eight a.m. So so there you go. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, but as an SRE, I'm used to getting waking up at weird hours and having to be on and smart. Duty, as sales, everyone. usually gets to work during normal <laughs> business hours. So that's the difference. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> so as we go into the the pros of using Helm, <clears throat> I could have actually made this list a lot longer. And it's still probably a longer list than you might have expected for a tool that's not as intelligent as operators are. But the title of this talk is Helm and Back Again. Um, so arguably, as Christian said, it's a lot easier. Actually, I said it too. It's a lot easier to get started with Helm than with operators. Simply put, there's less overhead into generating Helm charts than there is an operator. And especially because, as I've said before, you don't need to have your day two operations defined. And it's since it's all YAML, you don't need to know Golang. So a really nice feature in Helm is the config YAML file, which you can use to dynamically control the particulars of your deployment. This in conjunction with a GitOps tool can be really powerful as it can be leveraged to execute deployments with business logic attached. So from the persona of an application developer, this could allow me to execute A-B testing with the ability to rapidly turn it off through GitOps, pipe, GitOps pipeline integrations with Helm. So contrasting that to an operator, which could be programmed to do A-B testing, but then would need to be repackaged and re-released in order to change and remove the A-B test. And operators are just not designed for this type of task. It's not the problem they set out to solve. Uh, if you're an Ansible user, you can integrate Helm and Ansible if so desired. So this combines the benefit of Helm charts with the power, power of Ansible playbooks. But this isn't super dissimilar to writing an operator. And in fact, the operator SDK is Ansible under the hood. Uh, it could be a really good intermediary step to writing an Ansible operator, which is also YAML driven instead of Golang. And I think I mentioned it later in the talk, but as a note, and you saw it earlier too, the Ansible operators are exactly as full featured as the Golang operators. So if you don't have Golang experience, but you need an operator and you know YAML, you easily can learn Ansible from there. Just Ansible operator all the way, right? So Helm is better for deploying third-party software, and this is important. When you don't control the code, you don't control the consistency and the operations of that code. So using or creating a new Helm chart and taking care of your operator con operational considerations separately is a better strategy when you don't own the application. So Helm has strategies for rollbacks. So if an installation or upgrade is failing, the test rules, which is like, you know, I've, I've put through... My, my operation or my 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 application, right? I've, I've deployed it or upgraded it, and then I've had Helm do some, some post checks to make sure that things are working. If that's failing, you can roll back. It, ha it, has, um, it has that functionality built in. Uh, operators don't have that, right? Operators, you would have to kind of go with the roll back by rolling forward. So you, you make a fix, you patch it, apply it, and roll forward. And that's pretty common within the industry. 
uh, if your team is mature enough that you're at the point where you're looking at an operator, you're probably mature enough to also do that. But it's something to keep in mind. Um, it's again, it's possible to convert a Helm chart to an operator. So while the operator will remain more limited, it's going to be around a level two with a couple level three functions. These are great for when you need to take when you need a reconciliation loop. And like I said earlier, as much as I don't love working with operators that are below a level four, they have their time and place. And using it as a, a, a crawl, walk, run approach is exactly that time and place, right? And lastly, and this is really uncommon, especially because we're talking about cloud native most of the time here, K3S support. So I've used K3S for IoT servers. So that built-in Helm compatibility for Kubernetes on bare metal is absolutely game-changing in that world. And if you might even have to think about going to that world, Helm is going to be your friend. Uh, I'll send it to you, Christian, for, for bad cop. Yeah, I'll be bad cop. I'll, uh, Hillary's leaving the room. I'm, I'm entering the room here <laughs> in the interrogation room. So, so cons. Um, uh, cons to a Helm chart, right? So trailing CRDs are a real issue with 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 Helm, right? So the the cleanup of of a Helm um, a Helm chart um, isn't isn't perfect, right? It, it, it's it's it, it, there's there's still some um, uh, there's still some bruises and warts there, and often you need like some clever tooling to you know ar around that um, uh, that shortcoming, right? So there's still some with with, with Helm. There's still the need for that custom scripting that I talked about, where where operators kind of kind of shine a little bit. Um, Helm is um, needs that custom scripting, and that kind of brings to the, the the second point where you still kind of need to write a level three or above operator to you know basically from scratch, right? That, that's to say that the the work you've done is wasted when you've done a Helm chart, but the the, the Helm operator implementation doesn't extend Helm, right? So it's essentially you're you're wrapping operator-like functionality around Helm. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't actually extend anything that you get with, with Helm. So um, to get that additional functionality, you have to kind of wrap that in a Go or an Ansible operator. Um, these limitations are due to the limitations of Helm itself. And then those are done with intent, right? So there's, it's kind of their, uh, they, they're what kept Helm simple, right? So kind of our, our good points are our bad points kind of idea is that Helm, Helm is intentionally simple and it's intentionally to solve one specific use case, right? Being a package manager for Kubernetes. So anything beyond that, it's, it's going to take a little, uh, it's going to take a little work. So, um, um, so, you know, a, a big advantage actually, you know, kind of, I know this is the cons, but a big advantage, it kind of, it makes you wise up a little bit, um, kind of makes it a little smarter on the installs for the CRD issues. But if your application upgrades come with a database schema upgrade, Helm won't handle that for you, right? So, um, um, you know, if if a, a lot of the times, you know, we talk about upgrades and, you know, where operators kind of shine a little more is that what if you, you know, a schema change, right? That's, you know, people try to compare Helm and operators like, well, they just install software. What's the difference? Like, well, there's, there's a pretty big difference between installing software and managing that software, right? Um, like a schema change to a database, that's 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 a that's a big event, and there needs to be a lot of operational knowledge of that. Helm doesn't really do that for you. Um, you know, if if you want to keep from repeating yourself or have kind of a a, um, a a dry code mentality, you might find that the inherited models for subcharts is less than optimal for, for first, right? At first, so um, if you're if you're using subcharts or like an umbrella chart where it's basically a Helm chart that references other Helm charts is, is what a subchart is. Uh, typically, uh, variables that are defined for the parent chart must also be redefined in the subchart, right? It's like, it's, it's it, the inheritance is kind of weird uh, with, with Helm in, in that aspect. Um, uh, th this again is, is, is a piece that creates an, an uncomfortable amount, um, amount of human error. Right, it's like you you miss you miss the, an I over here, and you know you you misspell it down over here. Um, you know it, you may lint the YAML as much as you want, but it won't catch spelling mistakes, right? So it, anytime you introduce a, a human uh, element to something, there, there could be a human error. Um, and so this is that's kind of what operators try to uh, try to solve there. Um, whereas you know with, with Helm, more human interactions is uh, is needed, and so. Um, Kind of went quick with the Helm cons because I know I know we're running short on time. Because what really what we really want to know is who wins, right? Who wins this battle? Who you know? What do you do? Um, I think uh, I think uh, Hillary 
has, um, you know, big opinions on this, right? She does this <laughs> every day for a living. I just talk to customers. So I think uh, I'm going to hand it off to her to, to kind of talk about, um, um, you know, who wins here. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. who wins. Let's see. All right. Well, I have big <laughs> opinions on everything. So yes, yes, uh, true. So. <laughs> we, we could spend another hour just on my big opinions. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I've, I've mentioned this before. Helm is a great starting point in your operator journey, right? Helm provides a way to install a workload on cluster. It's easy. It's it's low barrier to entry. Um, this installation process has the ability to tap into pre and post hooks, like I kind of talked about earlier. And that way you can do some sort of like ordering of rollout, sanity checks, et cetera. And Helm also provi uh, provides you, you know, it's a templating engine. We said this. Uh, so you're not storing the same YAMLs over and over and over again, which makes it a lot easier to just kind of run roll out to many different clusters, right? You write some script that replaces some variables and, and you know, you're, you're good to go, right? Off you run. Um, and the upgrades are smart-ish, right? It, it, like we said, it, it can double, it can check some things. It, it, it has, you know, some limitations, but it's still, it's still somewhat intelligent, right? And this is honestly what most people need and want to begin with. So it's where a lot of people start. It's a great starting, uh, starting point. It answers the question, how do I get this workload onto clusters? And then you have room for refinement later. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, Christian, before we move on? Um, I, th I think really um, the only thing I wanted to add is um, uh, is the fact that going back to our initial our initial conversation about when when I said I, I don't know what I, whether I want an operator or a Helm chart. Ninety nine percent of the time, if you're asking yourself that question, it's going to be a Helm chart, and it, and it's true yeah. for me. Um, and I think um, you. I think you mentioned it before, crawl, walk, run. Um, there's just because you start with Helm doesn't mean you can't just move on. So um, really, that's that's really the the um, the only thing is that um, you probably want a Helm chart when you ask yourself that question, when you when you initially start. Yeah. If you don't know your day two operations yet, start with a Helm chart. Um, if you don't control that software. Right. And I maybe I talk about it on the next slide, which I'll have you move to real quick. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't control the software. Right. There, they, people who do control the software could be implementing things like floating tags, such as latest, which means that your reconciliation loop would just automatically pull the latest image of whatever that software is. And you could get uh, a, a, a failed upgrade that you can't debug easily. And I've seen that happen. So really, Helm charts is your crawl. It might even be your run, right? There's a lot of ways to, to make it your run, other tooling, integrations, et cetera, that you can do. Um, and then when you don't, own the software, like what I would recommend stack wise is GitOps, Helm, and Ansible. Put those three things together and go. That's your safest bet because that way you're never accidentally getting something you don't want and can't debug well. Next slide. Uh, so how do you know it's time, right? You do control the software. You're thinking about operators. How do you know it's time, right? <clears throat> so you actually can use the Helm operator SDK to automatically convert your Helm charts to some operators. And that gives you the reconciliation loop. Um, again, it has the limitations of Helm that we talked about, but it's the great next step, right? And it allow you to take some time to, to sort of live with your software as an operator so that you can start pushing the continuous improvements. Like I've mentioned, once you start getting to the operator thing, a big reason for that is it drives continuous improvement really effectively. So. When you're ready for a level four or level five operator, you're going to need to write a new operator basically from scratch. Uh, if you want to use Golang, you'll have to do it completely from scratch. If you want to use an Ansible operator, um, there's actually some guides for how to do it somewhat automatically. It, it's a little bit of, of some shell scripting and a little bit of some copy paste, uh, but you can get there with with some ease, right? It's it's not it's not world endingly difficult. Ansible operators use Jinja two templates. Uh, as a Python developer, I really like Jinja 2. I've been using it since before it was part of the standard library. Uh, so that dates me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm really comfortable with it, right? Yeah. You're um, like uh, uh, a Jinja um, a hipster, right? I was using it before it was cool. I was using it before <laughs> it was cool, yeah. No, yeah. I was, I, yeah, Python 3 brought Jinja 2 into the standard libraries along with the what pandas and some other stuff. That's a whole digression. And I was like, oh wow, all these things I've always used are now part of the standard library. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. But also now I feel kind of old because I talked to newer <laughs> developers on my team who are like, that didn't used to be part of the standard library. No, my friend, it did not. 
<laughs> uh, so we're almost over time here. And basically the heart of this is going from helm charts to operator, this crawl, walk, run approach, it allows you to do things iteratively. And I spent 11 years of my life in quality assurance. So I love doing things iteratively. Um, and as you, and you're reaching your level of maturity with building your application and you're just starting to understand your ap application and, and the operational pieces, and you're able to define when you actually have well-defined day two operations, like what are my service level indicators? How do I know if I'm meeting my service level objectives? When you're to that point, you're ready for your operator, right? That's, that's your time. When you know what you want to measure, that's the time. That's when you're ready to move over forward. And so, um, like I said before, you can use operators to install other operators. There, you can use operators to install help start install Helm charts. And honestly, what I would always recommend when you're looking at operators, when you're looking at Helm charts, when you're looking at an ecosystem, when you're looking at mixing and match, matching, uh, it's really never fully one over the other. It's really use a Helm chart to install an operator. Lots of Helm charts do that. You know, use your operators to to leverage some Helm charts to do some other pieces, and then leave everything in the main operator. This great use cases for that. You can strike a balance. You can mix and match these. Um, so when does one run over the other, right? Like Christian said, 90% of the time, you're probably going to want a Helm chart, at least to start. When you're ready, when you're mature, when you know your day two operations, when you know what you want to measure, when you know what your objectives are, it's time for an operator and you can get there. Uh, that's it. Cool. I think we're at time. Yeah, I think we're at time. I think... Um, um... Uh, Michael, I don't know if uh, we have some time for questions. I don't know if we have some questions. I could stick around maybe for a couple of minutes. Um, I don't. I don't see any questions in from the audience, so I guess no questions. Cool, cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hillary, for waking up early. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. For waking up <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, if you have any, any other questions, um, I'm on Slack, uh, Kubernetes Slack, Christian H eight one four or or Twitter. Uh, you can hit me up there. Uh, if you're a Red Hatter, um, I'm on Slack as well. So, cool. Yeah. Um, you cannot find me on Twitter. You cannot find <laughs> me on Open Slacks. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I respond to messages. I will answer that. Uh, I don't have a lot of public social media, though. So, uh, LinkedIn's pretty much how you reach me, or you ask Christian how to reach me. Yeah. And then no, ask me, me and I'll ask Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.